Okay, here we go. Ding, 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 and a one, a two, a one, two. Ingenuity, innovation, and cross-campus collaboration have been keeping patients more comfortable, care providers more protected, and have been saving lives as we enter the third month of the COVID-19 battle here at Stony Brook University. I'm Interim President Michael Bernstein and the host of this podcast series, Beyond the Expected, the Coronavirus Effect. And I'd like to welcome our listeners and viewers. Today, we will talk with two experts from our university whose areas have been driving results through what is uh, called nowadays engineering-driven medicine. They've been redesigning ventilators, fabricating face shields, making hand sanitizer, to name a few examples, all the, all the result of the rapid pace pandemic conditions with which we're faced. To give you an idea of the magnitude of this effort, 9,000 faculty and staff have helped care for 5,000 symptomatic patients who have come through the doors of our university hospital since we first saw COVID suspected patients back in February. Let's hear about the unparalleled work being done across our campus to meet this challenge. To do so, let me uh, in, uh, introduce our guests. Fotis Sotoropoulos serves as the Dean of the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Stony Brook. He is a SUNY Distinguished Professor of Civil Engineering. Since joining our faculty in October of 2015, Dean Sotoropoulos has engaged the college in a variety of major initiatives in collaboration with the School of Medicine, the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, and the College of Arts and Sciences, as well as in collaboration with the Brookhaven National Laboratory. He is one of the key leaders of our pursuit of solutions to major societal problems like the COVID-19 pandemic. Peter Tong is a professor of chemistry and radiology and a SUNY distinguished professor of chemistry and chair of the Department of Chemistry at our university. Dr. Tong is a founding member of the Institute of Chemical Biology and Drug Discovery on our campus. He co-directs a National Institutes of Health funded chemical biology training program, and he has strongly supported initiatives to build the uh, imaging infrastructure that links our chemistry department with other life science departments and with our School of Medicine. Pete is also the director of the Center for Advanced Study of Drug Action, the mission of which is to improve the prediction of drug effects in the human body, thereby increasing the success rate of new drug approvals and applications. He will talk with us about the research and solutions the Department of Chemistry has been offering to help deal with this pandemic crisis. So I want to thank both of you for being with us here today. Thank you. And let me start by asking each of you, we'll start with uh, Fotis Sotoropoulos and then uh, turn to Pete Tong. Let me ask you to give our listeners and viewers a sense of what your overall mission uh, and vision is in your units, uh, how many faculty, students, and graduate students are engaged with it. Thank you, Michael. Um, thank you for the opportunity. It is a really honor to be invited uh, to participate in this forum. Um, I had the chance to uh, to watch some of the previous forums, especially uh, podcasts, especially the more recent one with the nurses uh, from our hospital, and I was quite moved uh, and uh, by their dedication and commitment. So it's a special honor for me uh, to be part of this. Thank you, um, Forrest. And thank you for doing this. Uh, so as far as the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences, uh, we have um, approximately 160 tenure, tenure track faculty, 20 plus lecturers, several adjunct faculty, approximately 60 plus staff. Uh, we have uh, 4, 000, approximately 4,000 undergraduates enrolled and 1,600 graduate students. We are organized in nine departments. Uh, and what is uh, very um, unique and interesting about our college is uh, that we, in addition to the core engineering departments, we blend in uh, the departments of computer science, of applied mathematics and, and statistics. We have a department of tech, technology and society. And we also have two departments that uh, straddle the interface of uh, engineering and medicine, the Department of Biomedical Engineering and Biomedical Informatics. We have reimagined uh, re our research into cross-cutting themes, uh, focusing on society's grandest challenges, uh, like an engineering-driven medicine, energy systems for sustainability, smart and resilient cities and ecosystems, cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. We have also reimagined our educational programs to emphasize experiential learning, technology-centric, cross-cutting education across the entire university, global 
global innovation, empathy for humankind, innovation and entrepreneurship. We are also the proud home of, uh, uh, of women in science and engineering program and STEM, STEM smart programs, focusing on diversity, broadening participation for uh, the college, but also uh, the entire university and outreach to K through 12 students and educators. Our college motto is making science fiction come to life because that's what we try to do uh, both in uh, research, uh, in our research and educational pursuits. Thank you for this. Uh, terrific. Uh, Pete, um, can you give us a little overview of uh, what's going on over in chemistry? Uh, sure, Michael. Uh, thank you first for inviting me to be here. I'm delighted to be here and, and so honored much. to be part of this. Thank you. So the, the mission of the Department of Chemistry is to perform outstanding research and training at the interface of chemistry with fields such as biology, medicine, material science, physics, and engineering. And this tradition was established, as you know, by Nobel laureate Paul Lauterbur, who made his pioneering discoveries in magnetic resonance imaging um, as, a, as a chemistry faculty member at Stony Brook. So many, fa many scientific discoveries are made at the interface between different disciplines, and my vision is to build and support an environment that leads to collaborations between faculty within the department and with faculty in other departments across campus, both within the College of Arts and Sciences and also in the College of Engineering and Applied Science, the School of Medicine and neighboring Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, my department has 36 faculty, but we only have uh, 30 FTEs because several of the faculty have joint appointments with other units. We have nine lecturers, 16 staff, 35 postdocs and staff scientists, and about 200 graduate students. Uh, last year, our department spent about $10 million in research expenditures, and a significant fraction of that was sp spent on supporting graduate students who do the scientific experiments as part of their training. And as, I should, um, as you mentioned at the beginning, I should note that the chemistry department has uh, two federal funding training grants to support graduate students, the NIH-funded Chemical Biology Training Program and the NSF-funded Research Traineeship Award Harnessing the Data Revolution. And last but by no means least, um, chemistry enrolls more than 10,000 undergraduates a year in chemistry courses. Uh, terrific overview, Pete. And let me just emphasize again for the sake of our listeners and viewers, uh, you heard uh, uh, Dr. Tong mention this. Uh, Stony Brook University is the home of the MRI. And if you think about the significance of that discovery for medical practice today, I think you get a sense of uh, just a, a one sense of the impact our university has had. Uh, not only uh, across our region, but around the world. So, Pete, you mentioned an uh, interesting point, 10,000-plus uh, undergraduates taking chemistry. Chemistry is a foundational discipline across uh, so many fields that include both engineering, uh, Fotis's world, and uh, medicine. So maybe you could uh, take a moment to give our listeners and viewers a sense of how the basic science of chemistry, your, your science, plays a role in the research done in engineering, in medicine, you know, its, its centrality in the, in the scientific arena. Yeah, I think the, a good place to start is the, by recognizing that people become scientists because they're curious about how the world works. And this curiosity-driven research is the foundation of applied research that then, then leads to technologies and innovations to improve the human condition, such as new drugs and diagnostics for treating diseases such as COVID-19. The trick is to have an environment where both curi curiosity-driven and applied research flourish, such as at Stony Brook University. And I think to go on, I would say it's impossible to predict how today's fundamental science will impact the future, but it's critically important. For example, it wasn't possible to predict that the determination of the double helix structure of DNA in 1953 by Watson, Crick, and Rosalind Franklin would lead to methods to engineer DNA or create new therapeutics or, or genetically engineer living organisms. Um, or, and you mentioned MRI, or that Paul out of his daughter's trips to the local beach to dig up small clams uh, somewhat 50 years ago would lead to the um, magnetic resonance imaging, which can non-invasively peer into humans and detect and diagnose disease. And as, as you said, it has, has had a huge impact. Uh, in 2016, there were 39 million MRI scans performed in the United States. I, my goodness. And you make the important point, chemical processes frame... <laughs> 
so much of our physical and living world, it would be impossible to study any aspect of those worlds without getting your, your grounding in chemistry. Um, maybe you can tell us, uh, before we turn back to photos, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the successes in the collaboration you and your colleagues in chemistry have driven um, with uh, you know, other units in, in uh, the sciences and, uh, as we say around here, across the road in our medical complex. Sure. So chemistry is highly interdisciplinary, and it's the intersection of chemistry with other fields where many important discoveries are made. Uh, this can be seen clearly by the number of our faculty who have joint appointments in other departments, both within CAS um, and also uh, such as with the departments of physics and astronomy and biochemistry and cell biology, but also in other colleges such as the Department of Materials Science and Engineering in the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences and the departments of Radiology and Pharmacological Sciences in the Renaissance School of Medicine and also with neighboring Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, chemistry faculty are also members of centers and institutes that support interdisciplinary science. Uh, including the Institute for Chemical Biology and Drug Discovery, two DOE-funded Energy Frontier Research Centers, the Laufer Center for Physical, Physical and Quantitative Biology, the Institute of Advanced Computational Science, and the Center for Advanced Study of Drug Action. And this has led to advances such as developing brighter, uh, faster light sources to understand how electrons move in molecules, to better understand the universe in the seconds after the Big Bang, um, to the development of improved materials for water filtration, en um, energy storage, and to new drugs and diagnostics for human disease. Mm -hmm. And the the multidisciplinary uh, the multidisciplinary environment you describe is you know personified in you. You hold appointments in chemistry in our College of Arts and Sciences, as you called it, CAS, and of course in radiology in our in our School of Medicine. Um, uh, Fotis, let me let me draw you in here before we turn our attention specifically to COVID-19, uh, just continuing this conversation. Talk a bit about engineering driven medicine. What does that mean for our for our listeners and viewers? Maybe you can give a uh, uh, a definition and talk a little bit about the evolution of this particular strategy and approach to research on our campus. Sure. Um, so the the term uh, uh, engineering driven medicine is uh, is intended really to to, um, to mark, to indicate uh, what is known as the third revolution in medicine. Uh, essentially, the convergence of the life sciences with physical sciences, mathematics, big data, and engineering uh, in order to tackle uh, human health issues which are so complex that they cannot be solved by, by any uh, individual research discipline alone. Uh, it is really this uh, convergence of uh, um, computational approaches of uh, sensors, uh, all kinds of technology. Um, in fact, the MRI itself, it's an amazing piece of technology um, and a, a clear early example of an engineering driven medicine uh, that uh, led us uh, here at Stony Brook, um, uh, working with uh, the Dean of the School of Medicine, uh, Ken Kosansky um, and others to establish the Institute for Engineering Driven Medicine, uh, which is uh, really designed to bring together researchers across the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences, as I mentioned earlier, we already have in the college two departments, biomedical engineering and biomedical informatics, but very quickly it became apparent that it is essentially researchers from every engineering department that were involved in some uh, aspect of medical research or the other. Uh, so the Institute of Engineering Dream and Medicine was intended to bring all these folks together along with uh, clinicians uh, and, and uh, scientists from chemistry, from physics and, and so on. Uh, uh, to really um, organize, to tackle problems um, um, on kind of futuristic aspects of, of, uh, of medicine and clinical research, right? Like uh, regenerative medicine and 3D printing of organs, uh, neuroscience and engineering, uh, understanding and reverse engineering the brain, um, or advancing imaging and AI techniques to fight diseases like cancer, depression, and Alzheimer's. So the, the possibilities are endless, and uh, engineering-driven medicine is actually... Um, in a way, it's a new field that uh, we had to, uh, to, to create. It's what is, uh, we refer to as convergence research uh, across different disciplines that is really revolutionizing what uh, clinical care and patient care uh, will look like in the future. And, and Fotis, when you say convergence research, I mean, that, that's an interesting phrase. What exactly do you mean by convergence? So uh, perhaps uh, I, I can, I can um, uh, ex uh, illustrate this with... Uh, 
an example of great, two, right? Um, so um, I will refer, uh, there, there are many uh, recent uh, examples and projects that uh, faculty across uh, the College of Engineering and Medicine actually have been successful in getting. So um, just to give you one example, um, uh, the one big question, for instance, for uh, um, uh, doctors who uh, are uh, asked, who have to perform, to decide whether to perform a C-section or not, uh, is really to make a decision whether it is truly needed. And in the U.S., uh, if you look at the statistics, the numbers of C-sections have grown dramatically. I think most of births right now is, I think, like uh, 40%. Uh, I, I believe the number is Goodness. that uh, C uh, the, the, the doctors resort to C-sections. Uh, yet it tends, and, and it's, it is interesting because uh, apparently uh, for uh, for someone, for a doctor who looks at the data of the, uh, the that indicate the health condition of the fetus and the mother, um, and they have to make a decision on, on the fly for that, if they look at the same uh, exact same same data. Um, the same doctors at different instances without knowing exactly what they looked at, they, they, there is a high probability that they're going to make different uh, decisions because mm -hmm. there is a high degree of human empiricism there, even among the best experts. So in an effort between uh, computer science department and electrical and computer engineering, uh, an NIH project was recently funded which is intended to look at uh, data across uh, uh, fetal uh, uh, heart rate data and other data uh, from the uh, health of the of the fetus and the mother, um, approach it with uh, machine learning techniques to really try to identify distinct signatures there that may provide conclusive and certain um, uh, decisions uh, for doctors uh, and provide them, uh, the doctors with the tools they need to make informed decisions. So this is one example. This is clearly uh, what I mean by convergence, uh, bringing together unlikely uh, fields to solve an important problem in medicine. And there are many, many more examples and, and, like this. And I think that's a key point. Your point about convergence is converging on problem solving. Exactly. Right? Identifying a particular exactly. problem and figuring out how to solve it. You gave the example of uh, three so-called 3D printing of human organs. I mean, you think about you have biomedical engineers looking at the tissue formation, computer scientists programming the machine, mechanical engineers Material building scientists. the machine. Material yeah. scientists. Material scientists, on yeah. and on. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's really fascinating. Um, so uh, let me draw both of you in now. Let's talk about the COVID-19 uh, emergency. Uh, both of your units, uh, as I mentioned in our opening, uh, have played, continue to play a crucial role in our response uh, uh, to this emergency. So, uh, Pete, let me start with you. When when the COVID-19 outbreak, you know, uh, began, it seems like a lifetime ago now, but it's just a couple of months. Um, what were some of the biggest, uh, you know, initial concerns or, you know, checkpoints that occurred to you as the leader of the of the chemistry department? I think one of the biggest challenges was that the the situation changed on almost a daily basis. And so our, the responses we were crafting to deal with that um, situation had to change as well. I mean, I was uh, on my way to a conference in Italy at the end of February. I got to London as I was landing. The conference was canceled because it was close to <laughs> right. northern Italy. Uh, so I came home. I uh, came back to Stony Brook. Uh, March the 7th, we were told that uh, instruction had to go online. Um, March 10th, I had my last in-person faculty meeting mm -hmm. to discuss going online. <laughs> right. March 15th, you know, the Governor Cuomo told us to start working remotely. Um, and so we emptied our research labs. And then March 30th, we went online and, you know, one of the problems we had was how to deal with laboratories. Right. You might Maybe you could take a moment for our, our listeners and viewers. I think it's an important point. What's involved with, uh, if you will, shutting in the labs in, in response to the crisis? Well, we had to, we had to have uh, faculty, staff, and students work remotely. We had to close down instrumentation. We had to make sure the reagents were stored safely. Uh, we had to make sure the building was secure. So this is, I mean, this is shutting down a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week operation, right? I mean, this Absolutely. is complicated. <laughs> it's, it's not something like turning off the lights. No, we had to, I mean, we, I tried to prepare my faculty a bit to think about starting to pause research. And I think that went fairly smoothly, uh, but people had to stop reactions. Uh, they had to you know, put their reagents in freezers. They had to stop ordering material. And so, you know, 
because we were getting deliveries for experiments that weren't going to be done anymore. And I, you know, I'll just mention. Uh, I know as we begin to look forward, and uh, you know, we're we're all eager to look forward. Um, we're beginning to ask questions about how do we then ramp these labs back up. I mean, again, it's not like flicking a light switch. You have to go step by step, and it requires a lot of planful and intentional work uh, in that regard. So um, I think many people uh, in our public viewing and listening area are aware of uh, the remarkable accomplishment in chemistry with respect to hand sanitizer. So maybe you could tell us about that. I think people are thrilled to hear about that success by you and your colleagues. Yeah, thanks. So... <laughs> I think it was um, March 24th that we got a message at 9 a.m. From, from Nicole Sampson, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, forwarded from uh, Larry Zacharies, who's the Assistant Chief of Police and Director of Emergency Management at Stony Brook University, that the hospital needed hand sanitizer. And so we decided to make the hand sanitizer recipe from the World Health Organization. And so I sent a spreadsheet to my faculty saying, look, we need to, we need to get the ingredients now. Uh, within two hours, I knew where um, every ingredient needed to make the hand sanitizer was in the department. So this is ethanol, isopropyl alcohol, hydrogen peroxide, and glycerol. And um, then by 5 o'clock from the same day, Dr. Shabnam Davudi and Dr. Shinshin Yang, two scientists in the department, had made 17 gallons of hand sanitizer. And uh, I'm sorry, 17 gallons in how, in how much time? Eight hours. In eight hours. <laughs> <laughs> and we've continued producing. I think so far we've produced about 250 gallons. And you and you expect to continue operation, or are you uh, are you trailing to the end here? <laughs> I think uh, Larry and his team have distributed around campus, and we're waiting for the green light to make more. That's that's terrific. I I, I will say I hear. Uh, from our hospital leadership team, Carol Gomes is our chief executive officer and her whole leadership team. You know, uh, hand, you, you rode to the rescue. Hand sanitizer is in ample supply uh, for our healthcare teams. Um, and uh, we'll talk in a moment about another, another success with some of their other needs uh, in engineering. And, uh, you know, uh, that's been, a, that's been a, huge, a, a huge lift for them because as this crisis began, everyone was very concerned about supply. Just to, just to frame the amount that we've made. So 250 gallons, so a lot of it's ethanol. Uh, this is the amount of ethanol in 50,000 12-ounce cans of beer. <laughs> Oh, uh, we'll have to talk after the broadcast, Pete, exactly how you know that number, but I, I, I will take it I on faith I that should it's stress accurate. that the hand sanitizer is not for consumption. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's a different kind of ethanol. That's right. Um, so, Fotis, let's, let's turn to you in the same vein. You know, uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, begins. So what struck you and your colleagues in engineering and applied sciences immediately about the crisis and, you know, what steps you could take to, to contribute? Yeah. So uh, in in the college, uh, we have been framing uh, our research and our educational kind of vision in the context of what we call exponential technologies, right? Because technologies are changing really fast and changing our lives, the way we live our lives. But this change happens over uh, years, maybe months sometimes. I think what Pete described earlier is really exponential change in the scale of hours. And that's what uh, all of us, the entire humankind, actually experienced uh, in this uh, past uh, a few weeks and the last couple of months. Um, and when you are dealing with an exponentially changing situation, uh, looking at the past and at your, at your prior experiences uh, make it impossible. Uh, it's not particularly useful in terms of predicting the future. And I think Pete did a very good job predicting, I mean, uh, illustrating that. Literally, situation that was changing by the hour and we had to, to adjust, learn on the fly, recalibrate and, and move forward. So um, naturally, the first thing uh, we had to address is to support the, the university to ensure the health and safety of our students, uh, uh, our faculty and our staff. Um, we had to set up uh, ways to communicate effectively and rapidly. So I had to set up daily briefings with uh, the chairs, uh, with my chairs who were talking with their faculty so that I could convey to them in a real time all the uh, great information we're getting from, uh, from the university and the upper administration and your office, of course. Um, we had to 
learn quickly to work from home efficiently, efficiently, transition all our courses online, figuring out how to teach laboratory courses online, and of course, ramp down laboratory research, as uh, 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 Peter mentioned before. Uh, we had to, to think how to take care of some of our international students, many of whom were uh, stranded here because there were no flights. Uh, and I think uh, collectively, we put together a great effort uh, to find uh, places for them to stay on campus. And then we had to quickly switch gears to figure out how to support our, uh, our um, Stony Brook medicine and do it in a great hurry. And I know we'll talk about this a little later. And I have to say that uh, in the four and a half years I've been uh, here at Stony Brook, I have never been prouder by how our students, faculty, staff, but also the entire Stony Brook University community came together to answer the call. Uh, in a way, we all declared loud and clear with our collective actions across the entire institution that this darkest of hours is also our finest hour. Yeah, thank you, Fotis. I mean, eloquently said, and uh, you know, I want to remind our, I want to remind our viewers and listeners. I mean, Fotis touched on this uh, in his comments just now. In a, a matter of days, indeed weeks, uh, the faculty and staff came together and immediately uh, transitioned our educational enterprise to online activity. Took the necessary steps to protect the the research and scholarly enterprise responded to the needs of our hospital and healthcare system. I mean, a remarkable explosion in needs, uh, even terrifyingly so. Uh, and all in the midst, uh, again, as Fotis mentioned, um, of having to adjust our lives to this strange new normal, uh, working from home, communicating digitally, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, let me, uh, let me take a moment here to uh, remind our viewers and listeners and those joining us, we're talking with two of the leaders of uh, uh, the uh, multidisciplinary research endeavors at our campus confronting the COVID-19 uh, crisis, Dean Fotis Sotaropoulos of our College of Engineering and Applied Sciences, a SUNY Distinguished Professor of Civil Engineering, he's been a member of our faculty since 2015, and Peter Tong, the Chair of the Department of Chemistry, a Professor of Chemistry and of Radiology at our university. He's the Director of the Center for Advanced Study of Drug Action. Um, Fotis, let me, uh, uh, let me engage you. We, we talked with Pete uh, a moment ago about the chemistry department uh, 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 helping our healthcare providers uh, have hand sanitizer to meet this crisis. You... Uh, you built some face shields for them. So tell us about that endeavor in engineering. Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we have been working with the School of Medicine for a long time now, building this uh, joint uh, research initiatives in engineering, dream and medicine. But nothing could really prepare us for a global pandemic and a challenge like no other. When uh, our hospital was about to be inundated in a matter of days by a tsunami of disease, we knew little about, and uh, we were not quite prepared to tackle. So we had to worry about, do our healthcare workers uh, have the protection they need to save lives? Uh, what if we run out of ventilators, uh, uh, how can we do research to learn a lot more ab about the disease and so on. And as I was uh, uh, telling uh, my, uh, my, my faculty and, and staff in the college that this is the time where we need to refocus our, 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 our uh, to change our focus. Typically in engineering, we measure our research uh, using the impact of our research using the H index, right? How many citations our work, uh, our papers get and so on. We had to shift to measure, to do work that could be be measured by the L index for the number of lives that uh, we could save. Um, and one great example of this was the, the initial work with uh, face shields. Uh, the shortage of face shields uh, became uh, quickly emerged as an issue that we had to tackle very quickly. Um, and multiple, a number of efforts started on our campus. First of all, the iCreate team, uh, led by David Hacker, did an amazing job mobilizing all the 3D printers and putting them to work day and night to print uh, as many face shields as possible. In Indeed, I believe they were able to deliver 5,000 face shields to, to our hospital. And just to, to let our listeners and viewers know, iCreate is a so-called maker space on our campus where students can come together and use sophisticated equipment in this way. Uh, go ahead, Fotis. So, uh, but one limiting factor was that the, the, the 3D printers are inherently slow. Uh, and uh, we didn't have enough to be able to meet the demand that the hospital needed. And the, the demand could be in the hundreds of thousands, actually. So uh, on March 18th, 
15th, uh, our uh, chief of infectious diseases from the hospital, uh, from Stony Brook Hospital, that Dr. Bettina Fries, reached out to me asking for help to evaluate the possibility of working with a local company, Clearview, to manufacture face shields at large volumes. And specifically, she wanted to know whether w- what the company could provide for us uh, could work, could be uh, viable, the design was viable, it was clinically acceptable, and so on. So uh, I quickly engaged the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences Associate Dean for uh, Research Entrepreneurship, uh, John Longton, who worked with Dr. Fries and the company to assess, uh, to assess the viability and clinical suitability of their designs. Um, our college provided funding to Clearview to purchase equipment needed to manufacture uh, many facials in a hurry, and that was became uh, possible through philanthropic giving. So our hospital placed an order of 200,000 facials, and uh, for the record, we, we started working on this on March 18th. It was March 27 when uh, uh, John Longton himself picked up uh, from uh, the, uh, the company and drove to the hospital the first 500 facials uh, from that shipment. Mm. Less than 10 days since we started, and, and we never looked back. I mean, this, is, this was such an amazing partnership between clinicians, engineers, local industry that solved the problem. And again, not to be understated is the role philanthropic giving from our alumni and partners of Fletch uh, played in providing yeah. us with the needed resources yeah. to, to get this done. You know, I, I have to say, Fotis, you know, as I say, I'm almost in daily contact with the hospital uh, chief executive officer, Carol Gomes. And uh, thanks to all of your efforts and those of your uh, colleagues, um, face shields, uh, not the problem. And thanks to Pete and his colleagues' efforts. You know, hand sanitizer, not the issue. There have been other supply issues the hospital has had to solve, and they work hard to do that. But uh, thanks to what all of you have done, uh, this has turned around. I'm, I'm going to come back to you, Fotis, because I want to talk about another important innovation you and your team have worked on. But first, let's uh, go back to Pete for a minute and talk about, I mean, you've told us about the hand sanitizer uh, contribution, very helpful. But Clearly, um, there's research underway in the department uh, regarding COVID-19 itself. Maybe you could tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about those initiatives. Sure. Well, as as Michael said, um, we've gone through this short-term production of hand sanitizer, and now chemistry faculty are turning their attention to trying to find better ways to treat the disease, to detect the disease, and to protect people from the disease. And so there are a number of faculty with COVID-related research projects. For example, Ben Shao is developing better ways to, uh, for air filtration of face mask coverings. Uh, Awao Ojima is using artificial intelligence-inspired approaches to identify new anti-infective agents. Akala Simling is modeling the sugar polymer on the surface of the virus, which is important for the, viral, the virus to infect human cells. Uh, my own lab is developing molecules to degrade some of the viral proteins inside the human cells and so stop the virus from replicating. And then uh, uh, Elizabeth Boone is working on a a new project where she's trying to understand whether the virus affects the ability of hemoglobin to carry oxygen. Mm. And I should say that all these projects involve collaborations outside chemistry and in places like the School of Medicine, such as with uh, Jerry uh, Rubano, who's in um, the Department of Surgery in the School of Medicine. I, I'm, I'm curious, Pete, these projects you describe, have they been long-term projects? Did they emerge in the past month or two? I mean, what's the, what's the vintage on these projects? People are essentially retasking their expertise to tackle this problem. So they're taking their, you know, their, their knowledge and their experience and their <clears throat> current research programs, and they're turning them to focus on the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So, uh, uh, indeed, another example of what Fotis had talked about earlier in our conversation, convergence, right? Focusing on a problem and bringing to bear a variety of perspectives and techniques. Exactly. I mean, humans, we're, we're problem solvers. That's what we do. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an inspiring story to hear about how so many of you uh, in, in chemistry and in related fields, uh, you know, pivoting immediately and turning your research skills to uh, fight this deadly plague. Um, Fotis, uh, uh, I mentioned uh, there was another innovation I wanted you to have a chance to tell uh, to tell our listeners and viewers about, and that, that concerns ventilator technology. We've heard a lot in the news about concerns about shortages of ventilators for the most grievously ill patients. So please tell, tell us about that. So uh, this is actually quite a hard to believe story and uh, a very inspirational partnership indeed between the College of Engineering and Applied Science, the School of Medicine, uh, and the School of Health Technology and Management, which uh, came 
together with the help of New York State Assemblyman uh, Steve Engelbright and unfold, uh, unfolded at dizzying speed. We all heard about ventilators and the potential of running out of them. It was a big issue for the state of New York, a big issue for our hospital. Uh, and so we had to come together in a hurry uh, and try to help. Uh, and we, we set out to build uh, what we refer to a minimally viable ventilator for COVID-19 patients. And that means, uh, as Einstein once said, uh, we had to build a ventilator that it is as simple as possible, but not simpler. Uh, something that would work, that we could build uh, with parts easily available that could be purchased at any local home improvement store. We didn't want to have any supply chain issues and could be manufactured locally. But yet, uh, a ventilator that had enough sophistication and built-in intelligence uh, to be able to give a fighting chance to patients with severe lung damage if nothing else was available. And I have to clarify that this is the scenario we're looking at if a patient, uh, had, if no option was, uh, was available to, to provide uh, an opportunity for uh, our healthcare workers to save a patient's life. Um, so, and we need to do this uh, as fast as possible in case our hospital run out of, of ventilators. So what we did is we put together a core team of engineers uh, led by uh, uh, the College of Engineering Associate Dean for Research, uh, John Longton, Mechanical Engineering Assistant Professor uh, Dimitri Sassanis, uh, came quickly together with School of Health uh, Technology and Management Respiratory Therapist, Dr. John Britelli, several others from the School of Medicine, like Dr. Chris Page and Dr. Jerry Smith, Maldon played a major role in this effort. The core team worked day and night around the clock, literally, literally built the ventilator at John Longton's garage, uh, at times engaging the entire college faculty, the entire community for help with parts that were needed in a hurry. Uh, so just to give you an example of the timeline, this effort started on March 28th. It was a Saturday evening meeting at uh, Assemblyman, uh, Assemblyman Engelbright's office in Setoket, who brought together a team, uh, our, our team. Uh, a preliminary prototype was built by Longton and Asanis the very next day. Uh, the second prototype with oxygen compliant parts that was needed for clinical use was built three days later. And on April 4, it was tested on live pigs with great success. The design was finalized on April 5. And uh, in parallel, we were working with uh, the FDA in order to get expeditious approval if this was necessary. Um, so in the end, uh, our hospital ventilator supplies held and luckily this device will not be needed. And I'm saying luckily because if we had gotten to the point where we needed to use this device, uh, things would have been a lot worse than what we experienced. Right. That's, that's a very good point. I just I want to emphasize something here for our uh, listeners and viewers. Ten days <laughs> yeah. to stand up this device, uh, unheard of uh, speed and, and ingenuity and virtuosity. I, I would also uh, note... Uh, before you continue, Fotis, you know, the impact on the morale of our healthcare providers as they became aware that you and your colleagues were standing this thing up, that in the event of a, an egregious emergency, which thank God at the moment has not occurred and hopefully will not occur, it was an enormous lift because I think, again, what I was hearing through the hospital leadership was the growing anxiety of our health, our frontline healthcare teams that they would be placed in a position of having to determine who would get the what last available ventilator. That's the kind of stress. I mean, it's hard for us to imagine who aren't healthcare providers ourselves. So, in addition to the technical achievement that you and team uh, realized, um, I think you also have to pause for a moment and just notice the the impact on morale, the spiritual achievement, if you will. Uh, what this did to the spirits of our comrades in the in University Hospital. Yeah, I, I, it did bring us together uh, as an entire community in ways that was not possible, I think. It, it was two ways, by the way. It also impacted the uh, the drive and the commitment of our faculty. I, I have to say I've never seen uh, that level of effort and intensity uh, from the part of our, our faculty and students. Marvelous testimony of them. So let me, uh, let me ask, Fotis, you, you gestured toward the future. Uh, let's assume, uh, hopefully and gratefully for a moment, that this unique machine is not needed in the present emergency, but um, how do you see it evolving as a new piece of technology in the future? Where would it be used? How could it be used and so forth? Yeah, so certainly, uh, while I hope that uh, this is the last pandemic of this magnitude we ever have to deal with in our lifetime and beyond, 
Um, one thing I, I hope it's clear is that this crisis has demonstrated the need to be prepared so that we never confront a global nemesis like this uh, so unprepared as we were, we were when, when this started. And even in the shorter term, though, uh, there are now grim predictions that um, developing right. uh, parts of the world uh, where resources to fight such crises may be very sparse, like Africa, for instance, or the Amazon rainforest and so on, may be hit hard in the months ahead. Uh, so some of the solutions we have developed here could be deployed in uh, research-limited communities to help. In fact, um, our team is working uh, toward developing a portable version of this ventilator that could be deployed in, in situations like that in, uh, in um, other countries, other parts of the world. With, uh, Fascinating. Yeah. Um, so let me one 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 final thing on this subject, and I want to I, I want to turn back to Pete. Can you tell our listeners and viewers a little bit about so-called split flow ventilators and the work that some of your some of your colleagues have done on that area? Yeah. So split uh, split flow ventilators or split ventilators it was another uh, kind of solution of desperation, right? Because again, our ventilator was also similar when we don't have any of the appropriate devices to treat patients. Uh, so this is a um, uh, this is an idea to try to double the capacity of a single ventilator machine by attaching by two tubes splitting to go into two patients at the same time. One major issue uh, in doing so is that uh, uh, in order for it to work well, uh, the two patients have to be similar. In other words, their lungs have to have similar capacity of breathing. Um, uh, because, because the machine's on one setting. Right, uh, right yeah. because uh, if uh, one, I mean, the, the air would tend to follow the path of least, least resistance resistance and one patient may receive more air where the other not. Uh, and of course, um, a major challenge is that COVID-19 impacted uh, the uh, the state of the lungs of patients in, in different ways and uh, at different rate. So uh, nevertheless, uh, our pulmonary specialists at Stony Brook Hospital and some of our engineering faculty also uh, work to, to have ready splint ventilator design ideas. Uh, in fact, one of these designs uh, was already tested. Uh, it was developed by Dr. Jerry Maldon on uh, mannequins with model lungs and, and on an animal model. Um, and it, it did well. So this was another uh, tool at our disposal should things get really bad. And luckily, we didn't have to use them. Right. So, and, and again, to emphasize uh, for our audience, I mean, this is uh, notice uh, the, the comments photos made. You have a mechanical engineer. You have a pulmonologist from the medical school. You have, you know, other uh, others uh, in the engineering disciplines, material scientists all coming together to figure out how to put this machine together and make it work in the clinical setting under the worst of conditions, I might add. So um, an amazing accomplishment all along. Um, Pete, let me, uh, let me uh, draw you in. Now, I want to turn our attention uh, in, in the remaining time of our, of our broadcast to talk about our, our faculty and students and the future of our uh, research and uh, scholarly enterprise. Um, we've talked a lot about how the faculty in chemistry you know, pivoted so quickly uh, in the face of this terrible crisis. You gave us many examples, Pete. Tell us about the impact on students, both the undergraduate students and, of course, the advanced students, the graduate students you're training for future careers as, as professional chemists. I, I think it's tough, Michael. I think that, you know, they've, they're adapting to working remotely. I think the, you know, under Kind of a hard thing to do in a laboratory science like chemistry, right? It is. I mean, in the short term, you can, you know, you can finish manuscripts. You can, you can do meetings that are part of, you know, advancement to candidacy. Um, like first and second meetings, uh, you can read. And of course, that's something that all our students could do more of is read <laughs> and think about their science. Right. But this is short term. Um, in the long term, how do we get these people back into the labs? Uh, in addition, Fotis mentioned um, teaching laboratories. You know, how do we teach laboratory science without having in-person instruction? Um, I can tell you one thing we're doing is we're sending uh, over the summer, we're opening some of our general chemistry labs, and we're teaching those remotely. The students are buying kits where they can do experiments in their own kitchens. So this is a maybe a solution for the most basic kind of labs right. that we run. Right. But it's not a solution for advanced laboratories. I know we've been we've been talking a lot, uh, as as you well know, Pete. There's a there's a special task force looking at uh, restarting the research enterprise and restarting the educational enterprise. And one question is. How do you do social distancing in a laboratory setting without interfering with the operation of the lab and, of course, the educational impact of the experience? 
I think you have to be cautious how you try and do that. So one approach is just simply to assume that the environment that you're in uh, may be infected and the surfaces you touch may be infected and to take appropriate um, preventative measures. Right. My concern about like delineating space in the lab where people have to stand is that A, they won't stand there all the time. They have to use equipment maybe in other labs. They have to use shared equipment. And that maybe even by trying to get them to to stand in certain places and not to interact with other people, it might make the environment less safe. That's a, that's a very important point. Fotis, what about, uh, what about for students in engineering, another hands-on field, maybe with the exception of computer science, right? Uh, <laughs> you got you to gotta do things in an engineering lab. Right. In, in many of our departments, uh, uh, we, we have labs, and it was a big issue that we had to solve. So, um, in, in fact, uh, experiential learning is an extremely important part uh, of engineering education. Uh, so, we had to, to innovate in a hurry, so uh, try to, to record the labs and offer them uh, remotely. Uh, we, we, have, I, we had this idea of uh, using GoPro cameras, actually, and have uh, TAs, perhaps few people being present in the lab, being used as avatars from students uh, and being directed by students to to perform the laboratory uh, from through a Zoom call or something, um, but that's a big issue. I mean, this is something that uh, um, it made it very clear how difficult it's to deliver an engineering education which is relies so much on on experiments and laboratory, but also doing research in a, in a situation like this. Well, it's it's an important point you make, and Pete's just made it too. In every discipline, there's a, if you will, a contemplative side. You're reading, you're thinking, you're writing, right. exchanging ideas. And then in many disciplines, certainly in the engineering sciences and in the uh, uh, physical and life sciences, the world that Pete lives in, there's the experiential component. You have to experience the learning, otherwise you're, you're never going to... You're never going to advance your awareness. Do you have a sense, I'll open this up to both of you, I'm just curious, you have a sense of the potential impact of this crisis on student interest in your fields? We were going to have to work to maintain that. I think that, you know, when you look at the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic, it emphasizes how important science is and how important science education is. And so how, hopefully that will bring students in but at the same time, we have to be able to offer high quality instruction. And I, I don't see any, any way we can do that without having some in-person instruction. Right. I say, I mean, you make an important point. It seems to me the experience of this crisis presumably will lead a newer generation of students to have interest in the life sciences and in the physical sciences for all the obvious reasons. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I echo that. Uh, I think, if, if anything, uh, this crisis is making very clear the importance of science uh, for, for humankind moving forward. Uh, just to give you an example about the level of interest and engagement of the students, um, we, uh, we wanted to, in addition to doing this emergency research projects to help the hospital to engage our students, uh, and we try to do this through our uh, vertically integrated projects uh, as a major vehicle. Uh, we already had uh, projects, uh, vertically integrated projects are projects that are really carry, uh, carry over across the, uh, the, the entire education of students here. They are interdisciplinary, they involve engineers and other disciplines across the entire universities, university. So we had a number of projects uh, involved across medicine and engineering, but and as part of this program, we issued a call to arms to our students to self-organize to form uh, COVID-19 innovation teams through online discussions. Uh, forum. Uh, I'm really uh, proud to say that uh, as of today we had 160 students and faculty right now working actively on, on teams in teams uh, to uh, to come up with uh, design ideas for N95 masks, ventilators, face shields, pandemic pandemic database, hand sanitizing pouches for clinical workers, and on and on. Um, it, it was quite impressive to see. The, yeah. how the students responded and how passionate they felt about helping. You know, I, that's, I mean, that's very inspiring to hear photos. I mean, I assume, I assume, Pete, that uh, also in the basic science world of, of chemistry, let alone the other core disciplines in the sciences, there's going to be a powerful surge of student interest in so-called translational work, applied work that, as you've described earlier, your, your colleagues have already started to move to in the face of this crisis. You have that sense? Absolutely. I think 
you know, fundamentally we, we want to do things that improve the human condition. And this is translational science. And what you have to also remember at the same time is to properly fund the fundamental science that lays the foundation for that in the future. So you use this phrase, translational science, Pete. So why don't you take a moment to, uh, to tell our listeners and viewers a bit about what that means. We use that term a lot at the university. It means taking uh, discoveries made in fundamental science programs and moving them basically from bench to bedside into humans. And that is a, a long a process where you have to validate the, the molecules. You have to make sure they're safe. You have to test them in many different ways. And then finally, you test them in humans. And ultimately, you get approval from the Food and Drug Administration to use them to, tr to, to treat humans. Well, and, and indeed, what we've been talking about in large measure today is ways in which you and your colleagues in chemistry, Fotis, and his colleagues in, in engineering, our colleagues in the uh, Renaissance School of Medicine, have worked so hard to close that gap, if you will, that to, to shorten that time frame from, as you say, bench to bedside, from basic research to an application that is going to solve a problem or indeed better the human condition, and in this case, uh, uh, confront this terrible crisis. We, we have a few minutes left. I want to I, I want to turn both of you to talk about uh, maybe it's a little more of the mundane aspect of the research enterprise, but it's very important, which concerns funding. Um, maybe both of you could talk about uh, the dilemma in a way that our scientists and engineers are now caught in because they have research funding. Uh, it comes from several federal agencies, in some cases from foundations. There's support that comes from the university and from your colleges and units. But at the moment, they can't do their research. And what are the implications of that? And what are the challenges our scientists and engineers are going to face in the next few months, let alone the next couple of years in that regard? Pete, you want to start? Sure. I think I mean, one concern, of course, is the, the mental health of students who are not um, in the lab doing research. That's going to get increasingly worse. Also, I think, where's the money going to come from to continue paying them not to be in research labs? Uh, as you know, there's this fourth stimulus package, which is being debated by Congress, that has, uh, may have funding to do cost extensions for research grants so we can continue paying students. Uh, but ultimately... Uh, the model will break unless we find a way to continue doing research because you have to do, you have to generate results to justify the funding that you've got to then get more funding you know, through publishing papers. And it's impossible to do that when your lab is closed Absolutely. and everybody's at home. Absolutely. Right. Fotis seeing similar pressures uh, in engineering and applied uh, sciences? For sure. Uh, now, on one hand, we have a, a considerable part of our research activity is taking place on computers. Um, so that, that research, uh, I think, is continuing. And uh, we have our faculty are able to work from home, uh, virtually talking with uh, their, uh, the graduate students and keeping them engaged and so on. But on the other hand, we have a significant part of our research that involves laboratory research. And uh, this is impacted in very much the same ways. And uh, in fact, um, an important consideration is even though we have a no-cost extension right now to be able to pay uh, graduate students and postdocs, uh, if they cannot have access to the laboratory, um, to the laboratories, we are running out of resources or funding without being able to complete the work. Uh, that's why the, the need for a stimulus uh, uh, focusing on uh, allowing this continuity of research to take place is extremely important. At a time when uh, clearly the focus on uh, on research and uh, science and engineering should not diminish in any way, but it should it intensify. It should intensify, exactly. So, and this is a point worth emphasizing for our listeners and viewers, um, the grants uh, that our scientists and engineers work with, some of those grants are for things like equipment and supplies, but a large part of those grants is for personnel. Now, personnel are being paid because they're part of our university, our university team. But at the moment, they can't get their work done. So grants are literally being consumed, but scientific and engineering research has slowed down. So these are the, these are the dilemmas, I think, that um, all of us face in uh, getting the research enterprise restarted, of course, and... Uh, at the same time, uh, enhancing funding going forward. It's not just a matter of sustaining funding, as Fotis just said, but enhancing that funding 
uh, to start to deal uh, in more aggressive ways with this emergency. And I, I, I make one further point here uh, before turning back to our guests. Remember, Pete, Pete Tong explained to us how uh, our colleagues in chemistry came together and made hundreds of gallons uh, so far of hand sanitizer. In doing that, they were consuming supplies that normally they would use for their own research. So, I mean, that's fine. I mean, obviously, they were committed to doing this. But that's another example of, okay, now these supplies need to be replaced uh, for the research that they uh, need to do in the future. So these puzzles and dilemmas face us as a, as a university community above and beyond the emergency of the moment, the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic itself. So we have a few minutes left. I want to I want to give both of you an opportunity, uh, uh, as you wish, to uh, talk uh, talk forward. Um, maybe you want to single out what you think is the single most important lesson your unit has learned so far in this crisis, or what do you think some of the uh, positive opportunities are going forward, uh, or indeed what some of the challenges are before we wrap up our our conversation today. Which of you would like to go first? Sure, I can start. So I think that, you know, in terms of what we've seen from a positive point of view, it's been the amazing response of faculty, students and staff to, to step forwards without complaining, put all instruction online to pause their research programs. I think that's amazing. And I'm, I'm extremely proud of my faculty for having done that. In terms of the, the future for Stony Brook University, we have this strength that we have a a medical school and hospital on the same campus as a research university. And we've both acknowledged the importance of doing collaborative research to drive uh, new innovation and new discoveries, such as preparing for the next pandemic or dealing with the current pandemic. And a key strength of Stony Brook are the low barriers to collaboration between faculty within departments, between faculty between different departments in the same college or school, and uh, between uh, faculty in different schools and in the School of Medicine. And so these low barriers mean that, definitely where Stony Brook's concerned, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I think that's a really, really important strength, and one of the reasons, of course, why we're a member of the American uh, Association of Universities. Uh, I, I couldn't have said it uh, better. Pete uh, summed it up very, very well. So let me uh, add a couple of uh, uh, thoughts uh, looking at uh, perhaps somewhat a bigger taking a bit broader view in this I hope that we all emerge out of this crisis and by that I mean not only our university but um, uh, our entire um, uh, society and humanity and so on with a renewed appreciation of the power of scientific and engineering research uh, in situations like this uh, I hope we also emerge with a clear understanding of how we are all uh, in this together from cities states nations across the globe. Uh, and we appreciate the oneness of humankind uh, and the critical role of global collaboration and understanding. And last but not least, uh, I hope we use this as a teaching moment and we are able to translate the lessons we learn from this crisis into effective strategies to fight uh, the other far more insidious global crisis we all confront, that of climate change, which has a lot of uh, uh, lessons that we can learn a lot of lessons from this pandemic and apply them to climate change in terms of global cooperation and urgency and relying on science and engineering as a way forward. Uh, beautiful sentiments and insightful sentiments, both of you. Uh, I want to thank uh, I want to thank our guests today, uh, Pete Tong, the chair of the Department of Chemistry and a SUNY Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and of Radiology here at Stony Brook University, and Fotis Sotaropoulos, the Dean of the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences and a SUNY Distinguished Professor of Civil Engineering. You know what we've heard about today in our in our podcast, the various research and uh, uh, projects that have had such an impact on our ability as a university and as a healthcare center here on Eastern Long Island to respond to the COVID-19 epidemic demonstrate the importance of collaboration in the multidisciplinary ways our guests have talked about today. And I've mentioned our University Hospital Chief Executive Officer, Carol Gomes, uh, several times in this podcast. Let me close with uh, her words, reflecting on some of these projects we heard about today. Uh, Carol said, quote, they demonstrate the ingenuity and innovation that occur when a leading public university collaborates with a premier academic medical center. 
Um, all of these connections between the basic sciences and the engineering disciplines and applied translational work, in this case in a clinical setting, facing a, a terrible, terrible worldwide uh, pandemic. Again, I want to thank Fotis Sotaropoulos and Pete Tong for joining us. Collaboration is clearly a key to success. We're so fortunate to have the scientific and engineering expertise both of these men and these men represent and their colleagues battling one of the most pressing challenges of our time, the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to wish all our uh, listeners and viewers safety and health. Thank you for joining us on this episode of our podcast, Beyond the Expected, the Coronavirus Effect, and I hope you'll join us for our next podcast. Thanks very much. Uh -huh.